Welcome back, history students. All right, today we are continuing with World War II. We're going to be looking at political prisoners in the U.S., and then we're going to go back to the war in Asia. In 1942, President FDR issued an executive order, number 9066. That order told 120,000 Japanese Americans on the U.S. West Coast to move to what we call internment camps, which are really prison camps. Of the people ordered into the camps, 77,000 of them were native-born American citizens. So that executive order technically was a violation of civil liberties. You know, according to the 14th Amendment, all native-born citizens are supposed to be treated equally under the law. But in this executive order, 77,000 native-born Japanese Americans who are 100% U.S. citizens were going to be imprisoned, even though they didn't break the law and didn't do anything to justify being imprisoned. All right, so why did FDR issue that executive order? Well, the U.S. government feared that people of Japanese ancestry may not be as loyal to the U.S. as they are to Japan, or there was a fear that they may be spying on the U.S. So let me just go into the reasons for the executive order, and then we'll get to the U.S. Supreme Court ruling. Most Japanese Americans in the time period of the war lived on the U.S. West Coast especially in cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco. Now, the U.S. government was concerned about possible spies amongst the population of Japanese Americans, people spying for Japan. There are very sensitive areas on the U.S. West Coast. There are naval bases. There are oil refineries. The, a spy could watch the movement of our ships. A spy could spy on uh, military bases. Um, and other secure, high secure areas in that. The other concern was that if Japan invaded the U.S., the U.S. government feared that people of Japanese ancestry might help Japan defeat the U.S. and join on the side of Japan, not defend the U.S. This is a map that shows you where the relocation centers were for the internment camps. All of the red dots on the map were the, what was the permanent, semi-permanent internment camps. So you'll notice they are away from the coastline. So the people who were ordered into the camps were Japanese Americans on the west coast, and they were ordered to these camps that were in eastern California, in Arizona, and as far east as Arkansas, far away from the coast. So again, the government was worried that if Japan invaded from the West Coast, which was how they would invade, the government wanted to move people of Japanese ancestry away from the coast so that they couldn't help in the Japanese invasion and also move them away from sensitive areas they could be spying upon. Now, this was a very controversial decision because the U.S. government was imprisoning U.S. citizens, well, most of them were, who had not broken the law. So the U.S. Supreme Court did interpret that ruling. You know, the president can make an executive order in the name of national security. This was in the name of national security at the time. But the Supreme Court can always overturn any executive order. So the Supreme Court did look at this ruling to see, is the government justified in imprisoning Japanese Americans, two-thirds of whom were U.S. citizens? And the Supreme Court agreed with President FDR. They said this was a legal move. And they ruled in 1942 in favor of the executive order. This is a quote from the ruling. The Supreme Court said, quote, Residents having ethnic affiliations with an invading enemy may be a greater source of danger than those of different ancestry. In other words, 
We only imprisoned Japanese Americans because Japan attacked the U.S. in Pearl Harbor. That was an invade an invasion. The U.S. government did not imprison German Americans or Italian Americans because technically Germany and Italy had not invaded the U.S. That's how they justified only interning Japanese Americans. So the Japanese internment imprisoned whole families of people, children, parents, and senior citizens. The U.S. government did not intern German-American families and Italian-American families, even though the U.S. was at war with all three of those countries. Now, that's not to say they didn't imprison people who may have been Germans who they thought were spying or Italians that they thought were spying, but they didn't imprison whole families of people who were of German descent or Italian descent. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about the internment camps. When the order came down from the U.S. government, these internment centers weren't prepared yet. The, they were building barracks. They were pretty much making them like military bases. So they set up a lot of temporary camps, like these yellow squares. Um, and so the Japanese people were ordered into these temporary assembly centers. Some of them were race, like race tracks where they set up tents. And that's where all these orange and yellow uh, symbols are. And when these internment camps were ready, then the Japanese people were moved to these permanent, more permanent locations. All of these red dots are in pretty rural areas. So if the Japanese people escaped, they would not be able to go anywhere very far before being caught. So what these camps were, were military bases that had barbed wire fences around them, and then the U.S. military patrolled the outside. That's what they are. And they're pretty much like military bases, but you can't leave. It's, you know, you're imprisoned in a military base. Okay, before I go on, I just want to mention something that's pretty important. A lot of students often get confused between the Japanese internment camps in the U.S. and the German Nazi concentration camps that ha happened in Europe. Um, they're very different. So the no we're going to get into the Holocaust in more detail much later when we get to the end of the war. However, the Nazi concentration camps were work camps initially where people were essentially worked to death. They were given almost no food, no medical attention. They would often get diseases, and then they would die either of starvation or of diseases. And then the Nazis created the death camps where they did what we call ethnic cleansing, where they exterminated huge amounts of people through things like gas chambers. That's the Nazi concentration camps and death camps, okay? That's different than what the Japanese internment camps are in the US. So the Japanese internment camps um, are not concentration camps. The people aren't starved to death, they're not worked to death, they're not denied medical treatment. The people are imprisoned. They're not allowed to leave the camps without supervision. That was an order by the US government. However, they're not in prison cells in the Japanese internment camps. Inside the fences, the people were free to walk around, to live life as normal as they can get in a prison camp, um, but they're not confined to cells in like a prison the way we think of a prison today. So think of a military base with barracks where people live, um, communal bathrooms, communal cafeterias or mess halls, and people free to move around in those areas. That's what the internment camps were. So. In the internment camps, let's talk about everyday life in the internment camps. This is a photograph of a family living in the internment camp, two parents and a son. And that's pretty much what life in the internment camp was. Okay, so let's talk about life in the internment camps for the Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans lived in what we call barracks. 
And the barracks are rectangular, long buildings that usually the military use in their base camps. And they're divided into big rooms. And each family would get a, a room in the barracks. And in the room, you would have tables and chairs and uh, cots, you know, and, and, and basic things um, for every day-to-day -day living. But within the barracks, you don't have indoor plumbing. So you don't have your bathroom in there, your kitchen in there. You know, you just have your furniture. There were communal bathrooms that people shared where they would have showers and sinks and toilets. And then there would be a cafeteria or mess hall where people would have their meals together that would be provided by the government. So the barracks were really just where you slept and where you kind of hung out during the day. But other than that, you didn't really do anything else inside the barracks. The Japanese people were not allowed to bring a lot of their own personal things to the internment camps, like their furniture. So they were allowed to bring small items, um, but they were not allowed to bring their piano and their, you know, dresser and their car. All that stuff they weren't allowed to bring in the internment camps. So in the inter in life inside the internment camps, the people worked and went to school. So for children like this little boy you see in the picture, he would have gone to school or preschool. And they had public school in the camps. And the children were expected to go to school just like they were on the outside. Now, there were Japanese Americans who taught inside the, the internment camps. If there weren't any certified teachers among the Japanese people, they would bring in teachers from the local community to teach the children. So school went on normally, as normally as you can get in a prison camp for the children. And parents worked. There were jobs to do in the internment camps that the government would pay people to do. So if you had a degree before the war, you could still work in that field during the war. So if you were a doctor, you could work as a doctor inside the camp. If you were a nurse, you could work as a nurse inside the camp. If you were a teacher, you could work as a teacher inside the camp. Um, there were other jobs too. They had a, a dentist's office. They had eye doctor. They had store to buy things. There were jobs to do there. And people worked cleaning the mess hall, cooking, cleaning the bathrooms. They also, people grew their own gardens to kind of help supplement the government's food supply. People made nets for the U.S. Army in the camps. That was a job you could do. They grew rubber plants to help supplement the U.S. rubber supply during the war. So there were jobs that men and women got in the camps that they, that they were paid for by the government. Now, there were internment camps where the Japanese people were allowed to leave during the day and work in the local farming industry, and that would be under supervision. And then at night, they were reported back to the camps. So there were Japanese people who worked outside the camps during the day but had to be back at the camps at night, and they were paid. Now, they were paid a fraction of what they would have paid beyond the war. So they were paid very little, but you know they weren't paying anything for being in the internment camps, so they put that money aside. But that's what life was like inside the camps. It was trying to make a community, trying to make things as normal as possible. They even had religious services. They had civic meetings where you know they had like block leaders who would meet, report, and they tried to make life as normal as possible inside the camps. But again, they were not allowed to leave the camps. Now, we're going to be t we've been talking about how the war affected many different people in American society. For the most part, most Americans did very well economically during and after the war because the Great Depression was over. So most Americans came out of the war in a better economic position than they were beforehand, except for the Japanese Americans. The Japanese Americans were given about a week before they were had to report to a relocation center. So they had about seven days to sell everything they owned, to arrange for someone to rent their home or rent out their business, to arrange for their family pet to be taken care of. And a week isn't a very long time to kind of get your whole life in order. So a lot of the Japanese people lost their businesses, lost their homes, lost their, you know, sold their stuff for really cheap, quickly, and took a loss. And the government did store the Japanese Americans' large household items, like a piano, like a refrigerator, like a washing machine, 
at the owner's risk. So it was for free, but if they ruined your piano in storage, you don't get a piano back. Um, so other than that, people pretty much sold everything or gave everything away. And when they came out of the internment camps at the end of the war, they had to literally rebuild their lives because the government did not compensate them for what they lost during the war. So out of everyone living in the U.S., the only group that came out worse economically than they did going into the war were the Japanese Americans. And they didn't get any compensation from the government. In 1988, around 40 years after the war, the U.S. government finally apologized for interning them and agreed to pay $20,000 to everybody who was still alive who had been interned during the war. Now, by 1988, there were only about 60,000 people still alive who had been interned during the war who got the money. If you had been interned and you lost everything, but your children were born after the war and you died before 1988, your children got nothing because they were not the ones in turn. Only people who were actually in the camps got $20,000 each. So a lot of people said, why did the government wait so long to apologize and give people compensation? Too little, too late. But that's what, that's what happened. So the government acknowledges now that that was a mistake to in turn imprison people of Japanese ancestry assuming that they were not loyal citizens and you know the damage was done i will also mention that before 1941 the u.s military had japanese american soldiers enlisted when japan attacked pearl harbor all of the japanese americans were kicked out of the u.s military Again, the U.S. military felt they were not going to be loyal U.S. citizens. And all those men were imprisoned in the internment camps. However, after a little while, the U.S. government allowed Japanese-American men to enlist in the military. And so that was one way you could get out of the camps, is if you enlisted in the U.S. military. And there were Japanese-American men who joined the U.S. military and went and fought in World War II and fought very loyally for the U.S. government. A lot of them were highly decorated soldiers in the U.S. military. So today we look back on the Japanese internment during World War II as a mistake that the U.S. government made because they literally labeled an entire race of people as maybe being un-American. And we look back on that now and we say, well, that, that was something that was wrong because we ignored people's civil liberties in the name of national security. A lot of historians look back at the Japanese internment and they feel it was racially motivated. If we were to look at someone of German ancestry, Italian ancestry, and Japanese ancestry, which of those three groups looks less like white mainstream society? The Japanese Americans. So a lot of historians feel that it really was about, it was a, a racial decision, not a national security decision. You know, a lot of people, a lot of historians feel that American leaders looked at Japanese Americans and said, well, they don't look like us. They don't look like mainstream white society. They look like uh, Japanese people more than they look like white Americans. So therefore, they must not be loyal. They must be more loyal to Japan. That's what historians feel, that it was really a racially motivated decision. And that's why we didn't intern German Americans or Italian Americans. So that was FDR's executive order number 9066. And again, we look back on that ruling as a mistake that the U.S. government made during the war. And hopefully we learn from that mistake and we don't label an entire race of people as being un-American again. Now we're going to go back to the war in Asia. We've already covered the war in Europe and how that ended, so let's pick up a little bit with the war in Asia. Now if you'll recall, when the U.S. entered the war, the Allied strategy became Europe first, Asia second. 
what that means is that the Allies are going to focus on liberating Europe first, defeating Italy and Germany, and then focusing all our attention on defeating Japan, because Japan was going to be more difficult to defeat. Now, does that mean that we didn't fight a war in Asia while we were fighting the war in Europe? No. We were fighting the war on both fronts. There were battles in Asia at the same time there were battles in Europe. So let's talk a little bit about some of the battles in Asia. There was a major Allied victory in 1942 in a battle called the Battle of Midway Island. And the reason this is an important battle, it was a naval battle, is because the U.S. sank four Japanese aircraft carriers in that battle, and that really hurt Japan because Japan did not have the resources to rebuild aircraft carriers, which are massive ships. So that was a blow to Japan, but it was not not enough to get them to, to def be defeated. By 1942, Japan really has the upper hand in Asia. They're doing very well. They controlled the Philippines, Hong Kong, Guam, Singapore, Manchuria, and many other areas in, in Asia. So, you know, in Asia, they really have conquered a huge area. Now, they have not conquered all of China. China is still their number one enemy that they're trying to conquer. But China really is struggling by 1942. So the Allied strategy in Asia was to do something called island hopping. Island hopping meant that the Allies were going to attack Japan island by island in the Pacific. Literally attack Japan and liberate island by island. But there were hundreds of islands to attack and this was going to be very time consuming. It was going to require a lot of money and a lot of soldiers. So we knew that that was going to be a very, very difficult part of the war to win. That's why it was Europe first, Asia second. We needed to liberate more allies in Europe because we were going to need all the help we could get to defeat Japan. We were going to need the Soviet Union's help. We were going to need England's help and France's help. So that was why the strategy was Europe first, Asia second. Now, the Soviet Union promised the U.S. and England that once Germany was defeated, the Soviets would enter the war against Japan. Technically, the Soviet Union, the entire war, was fighting Germany to try to stop Germany from conquering their country. So they weren't fighting Japan in the war. They weren't at war with Japan. They were really at war with Germany. But Stalin promised FDR and Churchill that once Germany was defeated, he was going to come and help with Soviet aid to defeat Japan and island hopping. But he had one request. He needed a little bit of time before he was willing to enter the war in Asia. He needed time to kind of recoup, got to get organized, and then eventually he was going to come. So maybe a few months he was going to need. Now, what Stalin doesn't know at the time was that the U.S. was working on a secret weapon that was going to end the war very quickly, and that was the atomic bomb. So in the next video, we're going to look at the Manhattan Project, and then we're going to look at how the war was abruptly ended with the atomic bomb in 1945. So I'll see you in the next video.